Ja. Huh? Yeah. So, welcome to this PhD defense. Sunder Kletstow, the Sunder Kletstow, Kletskari Kletstow is going to defense, defend her PhD. He says now we will start with uh, a lecture by Sundberg, then the uh, uh, opponents will have a session with questions, and afterwards we will have uh, questions ex auditorium. And I'll hand over the word to Sundberg. Thank you, Gunnar. <laughs> I would uh, like to start by first thanking the university and the PhD for com committee for allowing me to present and defend my thesis during these uh, unusual circumstances. And also, I'm sorry about the delay. <coughs> As you can see, my uh, thesis is titled Sequencing the North Atlantic Herring Clopea Herringus Genome and Development of a Genetic Stock Management Tool. I will start by <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh, with a short introduction about herring biology and uh, describe the project aims. Then I'm going to present some of my results in the forms of the four papers that are included in my thesis. Finally, I will briefly mention the conclusions drawn from my work. <coughs> Atlantic herring is a pelagic school-forming fish with a vast geographical distribution. And as you can see on this map here, they can be found on both sides of the North Atlantic Ocean, as far north as Northern Greenland and the Barents Sea, and as far south as Spain and South Carolina. <coughs> herring is a migratory fish. It moves between feeding grounds, wintering areas, and traditional spawning grounds. It is one of the most abundant fish species in the world. It is an important part, uh, <coughs> uh, important source of human food, as well as an important part of the ecosystem in the Atlantic Ocean. In the recent years, uh, <coughs> the abundance of herring have increased in Faroese water. This has led to increased fishery, which in turn has contributed to the economy of the Faroe Islands. So this is a very important species for us. About 30 different herring stocks have been described. Some are small and local, whilst others are <coughs> very large and migratory. As the herring migrate, they can mix uh, with other stocks, and this happens especially at feeding grounds, and this can lead to mixed stock fishing. And this is not always easy to see for the fishermen because not all stocks can be distinguished by their appearances. The stocks are generally managed separately, so having clear catch data for each stock is important so that <coughs> you can s fish the herring sustainably. Uh, in my project, I have focused on these four herring, herring stocks, the Faroese autumn spawning herring, the Icelandic summer spawning herring, the North Sea autumn spawning herring, and Norwegian spring spawning herring. The reason for this is that they can be found in and around Faroese waters, and they mix during parts of the year. Distinguishing between different stock isn't always straightforward. There are several different phenotypes, uh, phenotypic methods used. For example, the mean vertebrate count or otolith chemistry. But here in the Faroe Islands, we look at the otolith nucleus, which indicates the spawning time. As you can see in this figure here, an opaque nucleus indicates a herring that was spawned in spring, while a haline nucleus indicates a herring that was spawned in autumn. <clears throat> this uh, information, together with the maturity stage of the gonads of the herring, are used to assign herring to a putative stock. <clears throat> Recently, different genetic methods have been used uh, to distinguish between stocks. Stocks are generally defined by their spawning time and spawning place, so they are believed to be genetically isolated units or biological populations. Therefore, their genetic profiles can be used to distinguish between stocks and also to define stocks. Different uh, genetic markers have been used, for example, microsatellites or single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, and also lately uh, structural variation. In this project, I tried to solve this problem of distinguishing between herring stocks by first generating a de novo genome assembly, then identifying genetic variations in the forms of SNP within individuals from our four stocks, 
And then I wanted to use these SNPs to try to answer some biological questions. For example, what does the population structure of a herring in the North Atlantic look like? And what sex determination system does herring have? Lastly, I wanted to develop a panel of SNPs that could be used to assign herring from fishery samples to one of these four stocks. <coughs> So I started by generating a de novo genome assembly. Now, this might seem like a long way from the problem that we're trying to solve. But when I started in January 2016, there was no herring genome assembly available. So we wanted to, uh, to get one so that we could get accurate marker markers to answer our question. However, a few months later, a draft herring assembly was published. So we decided to try to improve this assembly and do a comparison study, which we have published in November last year. So we generated three different assemblies from short, long, and linked reads, and by merging with the existing assembly. Then we compare this to the draft assembly. Now here are <coughs> a few of my selected results. Uh, A1, is, A1 and A2 are the assemblies that are generated from my data alone. The draft is a published assembly, and A3 is a merge of A2 and the draft. And here are, I have pointed out a few uh, metrics here that we were able to improve. And as you can see, uh, A3 is in fewer fragments, longer fragments, and has less unknown bases than the published assembly. We also removed some low-quality sequences from the assemblies. This resulted in some of the improvement, but we also merged and split up a few scaffolds, which also resulted in some of the improvements. <coughs> now, these summary statistics are mostly based on length and fragmentation, so they don't really say anything about the completeness or correctness of the assemblies. So we decided to investigate the completeness of the assemblies, this is mainly done by looking at the genes in the assembly. We use these benchmarking universal single copy orthologs, or BUSCOs, which are genes that are believed to be found as single copies in all organisms. <coughs> and as we can see here, the draft assembly actually did better than the other three. So it looks like when we removed some of the low quality sequences, we also removed some of the genes. In addition to the BUSCO analysis, we also did investigated the connection gene family. And here we saw that the draft assembly and our merged assembly <coughs> all had the expected connections, but there were some problems with repeated genes. Uh, these repeats were not present in A1 and A2. However, these two assemblies were missing a few connections. So next we looked at the correctness of the assemblies. This was done by finding possible errors or features using our sequencing data. From this data, we produced this feature re response curve, which you can see here, which uh, gives an indication of the correctness as well as the fragmentation of the assemblies. So basically, we want this curve to be as steep as possible. And here we can see that the, the A3 has the steepest curve and therefore should be most correct. However, the curves are pretty similar. In addition to this, we also wanted to look at the different features. This curve is based on 14 different feature types. So we looked at the different feature types separately, and then we ranked the assemblies based on these different feature types, and then we summed them up uh, to get our ranking. And in this ranking, A3 also was the best assembly. However, the draft assembly came second, and they were also pretty similar. So, <clears throat> so we did actually manage to improve the herring assemblies, uh, or we managed to improve the herring assembly in terms of fragmentation and correction, correctness, even though it was slightly less complete. Now, as we were preparing <coughs> to publish these results, a new herring genome assembly was made available, which was assembled at the chromosome level. So we were also able to use this assembly in other parts of our work. During the connection analysis in our first paper, we noticed that the herring connection nomenclature was inconsistent and unusual. Uh, these are gap junction proteins and are conserved throughout the vertebrate. But when we looked at the telios genes, they, were very, they had very inconsistent naming. So we <coughs> wanted to investigate if 
this was due to poor annotation and naming, or if the Chitelios genes were different than in other species. So in the second paper, we compared Chitelios sequences from databases and the literature in a phylogenetic analysis. And we published these results in BMC Genomics in March. <clears throat> Our phylogenetic analysis showed that uh, the connections were similar across all telias that we looked at. It was just the naming that was inconsistent. For example, several different nomenclature systems were used. If we look at this figure, <clears throat> these are the different connections. Uh, the first part of these different genes is the is an abbreviation of the Latin name of the species. And then we have the gene name, and then we have the database accession number. So here we can see that uh, for zebrafish, uh, they use the size-based nomenclature, and all the mammals use the Greek-based nomenclature. And uh, <clears throat> if we look at here Fugu, they use a combination of the Greek nomenclature as well as the size nomenclature. Then we also notice that uh, the same gene in different species had uh, different names. Here we look at GJA4, which is the correct name, but here in herring it has been called GJA6-like. And Then we also discovered the opposite, where we found distinct genes that had the same name within the same species. Uh, herring had quite a few of these, and here is an example where we can see the herring actually has four GJA3-like uh, genes. <clears throat> so based on our phylogenetic analysis and the rules set out by various gene nomenclature bodies, we suggested a new naming for Telios connections based on the Greek nomenclature. Here's a sample of the translational table between uh, our uh, suggested nomenclature, which is here in the middle, and then the old ones, and then the mammals on this side. <clears throat> During our analysis, we also noticed that some of the assemblies were missing some connection genes. By comparing different versions of the genomes, we were able to identify errors at the, at the assemblies, at the positions where these genes were expected to be. Here we have one example with herring again, and we noticed that the GJB7 gene was uh, present in the herring draft assembly. However, it was missing from the new herring chromosome level assembly. So when we aligned these two assemblies, we found that at the position where the GJB was expected on the chromosome level assembly, there was actually uh, some missing sequences and some inverted sequences. So with uh, our analysis, we could also point out uh, errors in assemblies. So now we have, had the, we have the genome, we've uh, assessed its quality, so now we wanted to answer a biological question. So the first question we looked at was, what kind of sex determination system is present in herring? Now there are various sex determination systems uh, throughout the animal kingdom, which is this figure shows. And <clears throat> for example, the best known is probably the XY system that we share with most mammals, but there's also the WZ system, polygenic systems, and even environmentally determined sex determination systems. And here we can see that the telios are quite diverse within their sex determination systems. And <clears throat> before this study, the herring sex determination system was not known. So we used low coverage whole genome sequences sequencing to find uh, SNPs, and then we did a genome-wide association study to identify regions on the genome that were associated with sex. <clears throat> the results that I'm going to present here are the results that appear in the thesis. Uh, these were found using the draft herring assembly as the reference, uh, but after I handed in my thesis, oops, after I handed in my thesis, um, I did the analysis again using the chromosome level assembly as the reference. So I will refer to these results a few times as well. So we sequenced 103 individuals with an average coverage of 3x, and then we called 50 million SNPs, and then we, that we tested for association. 
and we found that 584 SNPs were associated with sex. These aggregated on six regions on four different scaffolds. Now, in the new analysis, uh, we actually found 529 SNPs associated with sex, and they were uh, <coughs> they were on two different chromosomes, chromosome 8 and chromosome 29. So we looked closer at the genotypes of these SNPs, and we could see that almost all the females were homozygous uh, at these SNPs, while the majority of males were heterozygous. This suggests a male heterogametic sex determination system. However, we would expect that 100% of, of the males would be heterozygous. But we suspect that the low sequencing coverage, <coughs> low sequencing coverage doesn't show this. When we looked at the male, gene male heterozygous genotypes and compared them to the homozygous genotypes, we could see that the uh, homozygous genotypes had slightly lower coverage than the heterozygous genotypes. <coughs> now, when you sequence a heterozygote with only 3x coverage, you will by chance only capture uh, both alleles 75% of the time. The other 12.5% of the time you will capture the other one allele and the other 12% of the time you will capture the other allele. Now, we compared our <coughs> male genotypes to these proportions and they looked quite similar. So we decided to investigate further. So we compared, uh, <coughs> we plotted our proportions of homozygous genotypes uh, against coverage for both males, which are the triangles, and females, which are the dots. And then we also plotted the theoretical proportions for total homozygous, which is this line at the top here, and total heterozygous, which is this stapled line down here. And as we can see, the females follow the total homozygous model, while the males show the same trend, trend as the heterozygous model, although they have slightly higher proportion of homozygous. Nevertheless, these results still support our hypothesis of a male heterochromatic sex determination system. <coughs> so next, we try to identify what molecular mechanism could be behind the sex determination system in herring. We looked at the different genes on these regions, and we looked at the SNPs that were associated with sex. Uh, maybe they could have some cause effect. And then we also looked at insertions and deletions, but we couldn't find, we couldn't really pinpoint a me mechanism for sex determination. So we believe that we have not actually detected the actual mechanism, but we have only found the region where this mechanism is. There could, for example, be some unannotated gene, a non-coding gene, some structural variation, or maybe a sex-specific se sequence that we are not capturing in this study. <coughs> so in paper four, we finally get to the big question about herring population structure and the problem with distinguishing between different herring stocks or population in the fisheries. Here we wanted to find SNPs that could be used to assign herring to one of our four stocks. But first we wanted to investigate the actual population structure to see if these stocks represent true biological populations, especially our own little studied uh, autumn spawning herring in the Faroe Islands. <coughs> our samples were collected on research cruises and also in fisheries catches. We sequenced 103 individuals at low coverage that we used for the baseline, and then we genotype an additional 240 herring that should be used to test out our panel. <coughs> Based on our sequencing data, we identified 22 million SNPs, and we narrowed these down to 154 SNPs that, we, that showed discriminatory potential based on pairwise FST values. <laughs> FST values, or FST, is a measure of how different populations are. It ranges from zero, when they are the same, to one, when they are totally different. Statistical tests of our FST values show that all of our putative populations or stock, stocks were significantly different from each other. <clears throat> In addition, we also performed a cluster analysis using the program structure. And when we told structure to sort our individuals into four clusters, which are represented by the colors here, we could see that they correspond quite well with our stocks. 
However, <coughs> our analysis told us that this was actually not the most likely number of clusters or population. Uh, three clusters was the most likely number of clusters based on our data. And here we can see the results for three clusters. And as you can see, the Faroe samples and the Icelandic samples end up in the same cluster. But this cluster program only detects the highest level of structure. So to investigate if there was some substructure within this third structure, we, uh, we ran this program again using only the Faroese and the Icelandic samples. And this time, two was the most likely number of clusters, the Faroese in one and the Icelandic in one with a bit of ad admixture. <coughs> so we could uh, confirm that there was some substructure here. We also used the Ivano method to find the most likely number of clusters, and we got similar results. However, the first, <coughs> first we got two clusters, the Norwegian spring spawners in one and the others in the second cluster. So when we removed the Norwegian samples, we again got two as the most likely number of clusters. But this time, the North Sea was in one cluster and the Faroese and Icelandic were in the other one. So finally, when we ran only the Faroese and Icelandic samples, we again got two as the most likely number of clusters. Now, this indicates some hierarchical structuring. Now, structure only uses, or we told structure to only use our 154 SNPs. So we also did a <coughs> another approach where we used 4.6 million SNPs in a principal component analysis to look at the clustering. And as we can see here, the Norwegian spring spawning herring form one cluster. The North Sea <coughs> autumn spawners form sort of one cluster, except for these five here, which I will mention in a bit. And then again, the Faroese and the Icelandic samples form one cluster. So again, we ran this using only the Faroese and the Icelandic samples. And here we can see that the Faroese samples cluster in the corner while the Icelandic samples are more spread out. Now, this could maybe indicate that the that the Faroese stock is a subpopulation of the Icelandic population. And maybe that it has diverged too recently for us to actually uh, be able to detect it. Okay, now these five herring here are labeled as Faroese herring because they were caught within a Faroese fjord. However, all of our genetic analysis indicate that they are actually part of the North Sea autumn spawning herring. Now, this is the first time that we have actually been able to show that the North Sea herring comes all the way into the Faroese fjords. They have been discovered in Faroese waters and on the banks before. So this sort of highlights how <laughs> useful these genetic analyses are, because we would not be able to detect this with only the traditional methods. <clears throat> Having looked at the population structure, we tried to assign the individuals to a stock. But first we tested out our uh, panel. We used the baseline samples and then a Monte Carlo cross-validation. And these results, uh, this gave good uh, assignment accuracy between 89% and 97%. So when we tried to assign uh, our 240 test individuals, the results were a bit different uh, for the Norwegian spring spawners and the North Sea autumn spawning herring, we got good assignment accuracy up in the 90%. However, the Icelandic and the Faroese samples had very poor assignment, lower than 50% assignment accuracy. So uh, <coughs> based on our previous clustering results, we tried merging the Icelandic and the Faroese samples in the baseline, <coughs> in our baseline, and then we um, assigned the samples again. And this time the assignment accuracy was a lot better, especially <laughs> for this third cluster. The assignment increased to 88%. So <laughs> finally, we can say we were able to show that our panel could be used to assign herring fishery samples to the North Sea autumn spawning herring, the Norwegian spring spawning herring, or a combined Faroese and Icelandic herring. And this could be useful in uh, keeping the herring fishery sustainable. However, I think we could do some more work to get a better conclusion regarding the Faroese and Icelandic samples. <clears throat> so to sum up, sum up <clears throat> we, uh, 
we generated a genome assembly with improved summary statistics and correctness, but that was slightly less complete. By doing this, we also validated the existing herring genome assembly. <clears throat> and then in our second paper, we showed that the pattern of connection genes is similar uh, within herring and other telias, but it's just a naming that's inconsistent. Based on this, we were able to suggest a new, more consistent naming. And we also showed that these connection sequences could be used to indicate errors in high quality assemblies, for example, within herring. And we identified two sex determination regions on chromosome 8 and 29 in the herring genome. And then we suggested a male heterochromatic sex determination system. And then in the fourth paper, we found that all of our putative populations were significantly different from each other, although the Faroese and the Icelandic results were a bit conflicting. We were able to assign the North Sea and the Norwegian spring spawning herring uh, with an assignment accuracy over 90, roughly 90%. And when we merged the Faroese and the Icelandic samples, we got an assignment accuracy of 88%. Now, of course, I haven't done all of this on my own. I have gotten help from a lot of people, and I would like to take this time to uh, thank everyone who has helped me in one way or another throughout this project. Although I think that these people deserve a special thanks. And I also want to uh, thank the people who helped me collect the samples. And then, of course, the funding bodies and institutes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm sorry for the confusion at the start. Um, we had some technical issues, but I hope it's working better now. Um, so what will happen now is that um, the committee, the opponents will, two of the opponents will ask questions. And uh, when they have finished their session. There will be questions ex auditorium. People have been able to submit questions by email. And if uh, anybody has questions for the last session, they have to join the Zoom meeting and, and post the question online as a QA. Uh, and then I'll uh, give the word to the opponents. Thanks, Gunnar. Um, so this is Tom. Uh, I'm the chair. I uh, I just want to say before you start, it was a very, very nice thesis. Um, I'm not going to ask you questions. Einar and Bent are going to take that on. So I just wanted to, before they do that, say uh, I very much appreciated your talk. I, I'm extremely sympathetic for the uh, horrendous uh, nightmare you've been through in the past. <laughs> God knows how many months and the uh, constant tweak and all this, but at least we got to see many versions of your thesis, which was nice. Uh, but with that, I will hand over to Bent and Einar and come back at the end. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm also, uh, I was very impressed with the with the thesis and uh, I was given the honor since I'm the sort of the most uh, fisheries guy here. So I have a few questions uh, regarding your sort of introduction to everything, which may may also help clear up some of the questions, more specific questions uh, okay. late, later on. So, so what we were, what we were talking about is, so in the introduction, you were talking about the Atlantis Scandic hearing, which mm -hmm. is sort of, uh, sometimes it's defined as a, as a stock, and sometimes it's a population, and sometimes it's populations, and so, I'm, so, so I was just a little bit curious uh, about sort of how is a stock or a population or a conglomerate of population, how is that defined in, 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 in relation to fisheries? Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, 
the definition of a stock is quite, as you mentioned, is quite fluffy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the easiest way to describe what the stock is, is a practical, practical, uh, how would you say, uh, yeah, a practical uh, lump of herring or fish. Yeah. Usually it's fish that's found within the same space and area. Uh, for herring, uh, they are, uh, they usually have traditional spawning grounds and uh, a spawning time. So they're, the herring stocks are usually defined by that, but uh, it's not always easy to use that within fisheries. It's not practical. So when you're doing fisheries management, sometimes you you will have one population, and sometimes you can have several populations. For example, if it's more practical to to uh, manage two populations together, you would co you could call them one stock. Um, <clears throat> but also sometimes you don't actually know if these are two different populations. This is just something that we have been fishing for a hundred years and they usually turn up here. So we call this the fairy stock or something like that. Yeah, because I, I find it quite interesting also because dealing with, uh, with fisheries, you also talk about, so you have ecologists who have a, an ecological definition. So what is there any distinction between say, an ecological definition of a population or a genetic, so a population genetic definition. So, so do these differ? So when you talk to the ecologist, what, what would they term a population? Yeah, so uh, I guess uh, an ecologist would look at uh, through the whole life history of the herring, where it goes, where like we, if we say we have one population, one genetic population, so we'll define that as a population that is uh, that spawns. Okay, we're going to be very strict and say there's no gene flow or anything. It's just one population spawning in one place at one time. So there's no genetics going between this stock and this population or other populations. So this is what I would call a genetic population. However, an ecologist might not see it as uh, that. He might look at the whole uh, life history of the herring. So if you have several populations that only separate when they uh, when they spawn and then for the rest of their life they are together, you might call them a single population if you mm. were an ecologist. Yeah. So so I'm yeah, I've been working in this business for a long time, but still I'm very fascinated by the finding that sort of fish populations in the ocean, open ocean without borders, have like you said yourself in thesis, they have pelagic eggs and, and and larvae. So, so how how can you have genetically different populations, sort of, without borders, or are there borders in in, in the oceans? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll start by looking. You say, are there borders in the ocean? Um, the ocean sounds like a very uniform environment, but there's actually difference in salinity throughout the ocean. For example, in the Baltic Sea, it's very uh, high salinity compared to the uh, Atlantic Ocean. So there's some difference there. And then there's also these uh, mixing points between the different oceans. But then you also have a difference in temperature. And also you have like, a, what you call it, landscape at the bottom that differs. So uh, even though we might not see it as there are any borders, there could be borders, could define it as biological borders. If a herring is... Uh, evolves to live uh, with low salinity or high salinity, then it would be difficult to cross this border even though it's invisible. Mm. So so just, so you have a herring, they spawn in one place at one time and then the larvae go off somewhere. Mm -hmm. So 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 why, how, 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 how do they come back? Yeah, so uh, yeah, the larvae are pelagic, so they just float around, they follow the ocean currents. And then uh, <clears throat> they usually, when the herring start to grow and they can swim, they uh, tend to come back to their, uh, come back to their home. Yeah. So usually they have these uh, juvenile uh, places where they will grow. And they, uh, for example, the Norwegian spring spawning herring grows up in the Barents Sea. So there's a lot of food and then it can grow big enough to uh, migrate and then it migrates back to its traditional grounds 
And I think it's believed the herring that uh, this is sort of uh, they follow the older herring to the traditional spawning grounds, which sounds kind of sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I think also uh, when you look at the collapse of the Atlantoscando herring, that when uh, the population collapsed, uh, the migration routes also changed. So if all the old, all the old herring die, then the younger ones don't know where to go. Mm. But now there seem, it looks like they are sort of finding these old migration routes again. So they probably learn from experience. Yeah. So those are very practical routes to take if you think about food. So that's probably why they're finding these old routes again. Yeah. So there's a lot of, yeah, by the way, my regards from Dorda Begevon, who is the, my nearest colleague and the, the herring expert here at at DTU Aqua, and she's done a lot of genetic studies on herring, and there's quite a few genetic studies around the world. But sometimes people come up with different conclusions uh, regarding population structure. So, so, so why do you think that people? So it's not always people agree on on. So yeah, from the ecologist I know, they say geneticists they tend to disagree all the time. So you can never get a firm answer from a geneticist. They always say, "Yeah, there's two populations here. No, there's not." And 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 that's that's been a frustrating part of uh, including genetics in in fisheries management. So, can you give any advice on why why is it like that? Yeah, I think uh, if you, for example, look at the <clears throat> the older studies. You maybe would say, oh, these, this is only one stock, but now we're using different methods, better methods. And with these newer methods, we can actually see, oh, no, these were two different populations. We just couldn't find it with our older methods. So that's one thing. The technology or is changing all the time. So this might change the, the way we see the population structure. Mm. <clears throat> and also, I think maybe you think about um, experimental design. If you haven't designed your experiments correctly, you don't have enough samples, then you could get false population structure. Mm. So, so you were also, and we're going to come back to that later on, but you were also uh, talking about uh, phenotypic uh, methods. And it may be, a, that's also a little bit of a controversial question in, in, in fisheries. So, should you use uh, phenotypic methods on, or should you use genetics? And, and uh, uh, so that's also something about uh, the costing and uh, the availability of, of, of markers and, and so on. But mm -hmm. what, what do you think in general? So, so, so what, is the, what is the pros and cons for phenotypic methods and, and genetic methods? Yeah, so uh, with the phenotypic methods, um, some of them are uh, affected by the environment. On the one hand, this is a good thing because this is how you can actually distinguish between them. But uh, on the other hand, it can the environment can change very quickly before you notice that it's changing. But then also, usually you have uh, a human person who looks at the phenotypic features and uh, two different person might discuss might see different things when you look at, for example, the maturity stage of a gold gnat, which is pretty hard to, <laughs> to estimate. So two different peoples can actually give two different results. So that's one of the negatives of using phenotypic methods. <clears throat> with, yeah, with genetic methods, of course, first it's very expensive to define these. Uh, the initial uh, examinations are very expensive when you find markers and when you define the different stocks. And then after that, it can can come become cheap, but it's still not as cheap as the phenotypic methods. So that's one major disadvantage. However, <clears throat> some studies have shown that if you use this within uh, fisheries, so you use this to maybe give fines if uh, for illegal fishing, and then you could collect the money back that way. And mm. you could actually uh, yeah, it will equals to zero. So I think that the best would be to use a combination of both. I think they complement each other very well. And mm. I think especially with my five migrant herring shows how good both methods work together. Yeah. So, so, 
So it may be a little bit out of your league, but I, I, I'm sort of, it's it's related to, so in, in the Faroe, Faroe Islands, you have a, a system. So of course, people are always looking for practical implementation of, uh, of genetics. So you have a, both a quota and a fishing day system. So if you wanted to implement genetic tools for monitoring, is that... Is that a problem, or is that uh, how does that relate to the to the control system you have now, basically? <coughs> yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't think it should be a problem, but uh, I think maybe some politicians would think <laughs> it was a problem. But uh, I mean, you're doing monitoring anyways, so uh, they're taking samples and uh, checking for both for uh, sock management and also. To control. So I think when you're taking those samples, you might as well just take a DNA sample as well. It's just the extra cost that would be the problem, I think. Who mm. should pay for that? Should it be the industry or should it be uh, the government? Mm. I think that's where the issue would lie. Mm. So, how, so how do you see it? it? Do you see it in the assessment so that, that when people are doing a stock assessment, then you should... Uh, at the same time, get an estimate of the proportion of different populations contributing to the fishery? Or, uh, yeah, I think uh, when you're doing this uh, uh, trawling, uh, what you call them? Uh, so yeah, when you, yeah, when you're doing the surveys, you could use them to see if... Uh, one, one way you could use it was to actually could to control your... Uh, your phenotypic methods, just to see if they give the same results. But I think also in the fishery samples, when there's a when a boat is comes in shore, and then you will go on board and check, see what mm. how, what big how big the proportion of Norwegian spring spawners. So, so could you imagine a, a system where you could actually have sort of if you have fishing days that that uh, in the beginning or the end of the season you would be catching specific populations rather than just fishing a a, a, a mixture? Mm, yeah, so I guess you could also use this to see if when the the different stocks uh, mix, and then you could implement that in the fishing days. So you'd see, okay, today we are it's usually fifty percent. Norwegian spring spawners and 50% fairies or something like that. And then you could just alter your quotas through the year. Although I don't know how practical that is, but I guess <laughs> no, no, <laughs> theoretically no. you could do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just have uh, so one more thing about sort of the, 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 the more population specific part of, of, of your introduction is, is that so you, you're also talking about calling SNPs for population genetic analysis. So how is sort of, so do you have any idea what it was sort of the best, best, best practice for calling SNPs? So if you want to investigate population structure within ferries waters, would you do it the same way as if you were looking at SNPs on a wider geographical scale or is it is it basically the same or could you just I would even looking at your presentation now. I was even thinking, why well, uh, you could just have taken your your, your gene uh, the gene assembly, the first one, and then just looked at the polymorphisms there and used those instead of doing lo low coverage sequencing. So why didn't you do that? So why why did you bother going through this rather tedious uh, job of having to resequence a lot of if individuals? Yeah. So uh, well, firstly, you couldn't. Well, I could, but if you just use the first study with, I think, say there are four different herrings there. Yeah. There's quite, there isn't a lot of variation or there's a very uh, much information that you wouldn't capture. So within the whole population. So <clears throat> because your sample size is so small, you might not, not capture the, uh, the specific SNPs that are different between the populations, especially if, if all those were from the same population. All those, mm. I think they weren't, but yeah, I think those are from two different populations. So you wouldn't capture uh, the variation from the other stocks. So that's why mm. you need to do the resequencing from the different, uh, 
from the different stocks. Yeah. So, so for instance, I know that in 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 brood stock. So, like, if you want to do a, a snip chip for pigs, you you take a, yeah, you basically take one pig and then you 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 genotype, <laughs> then you put the snips from that individual on the. So, given that you you get so many snips, so wouldn't you capture that? Uh, so, wouldn't you have how you would have a huge number of snips anyway, wouldn't you? Even though that you didn't resequence in the individuals. Yeah, you would have a lot of snips, yes. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure you would capture the right snips. Well, no. <laughs> you could, but uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, you don't know until you try. I think. No. So, yeah. so, so for instance, if your if your if your primary interest is to look distinguish between Icelandic and Faroese herring. So is is there a specific strategy for that then? To to if you're looking at a very local scale. <clears throat> so how would how would you how would you if you are only look if that was the only question in the world that you were interested in? So how would you how would you go about uh, doing the snip the snip uh, identification or snip calling or whatever? Yeah. So um, yeah, if you go about doing it now when there's already an assembly available and giving SNP panels, then you would just genotype uh, these SNPs from uh, several individuals. And of course, you would you would want enough individuals from the two different populations to, um, so you could see the whole genetic variation within the population. And so if you just look at one fish from the Faroese and one from the Icelandic, you would see loads of different SNPs that are not the same, but of course, this could just be individual variation. So you need a few of each so you can actually see which SNPs are within which, which population. Yeah. Uh, we, we're going to come back to that later, but I, I was just curious because when you did your presentation, you showed you that there was, you went from 22 million to 154. And then, mm -hmm. there, then you said there was, there was 600 out of the 22 million, was it something like that? That had a uh, with with a significant FST or something like that. Uh, yeah, one hundred and fifty four. Okay. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we started. We looked at the the pairwise. So we took the top one hundred from each comparison, which was the six hundred, and then we uh, and then we looked at the link LD and uh, also which samples actually had data. So that's how we narrowed it down to the one hundred and fifty four. Hmm. But we're we're going to come back to that uh, later on. Yeah. I think I've I've talked enough for for now. I think I will give the word to uh, to Ben and uh, then uh, uh, unless Ben, if you do you have any questions regarding this uh, sort of more general biology stuff, are you ready to go on with the with the more technical genome? Yeah. Stuff? So I'm the least fishy person here, <laughs> but the more bioinformatics person, I guess. I don't know. Uh, at least I, 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 I know less about fish than, than I know does. Uh, I just want to start by saying that I really enjoyed reading it. I know much more about fish now than I ever thought I would. <laughs> and I particularly found it very interesting that you can, you can take the uh, otto leaf, or how you pronounce it, and actually count um, the rings and see how old the fish is. Um, so I, I have a so I might have some uh, question in regards to the fish, and I'm not trying to fish for something wrong. It's just because you know I'm blind from my disguise. But how do you actually when you look at these? Uh, if you look at page six in your thesis, like the old version I have, I guess it's easier to refer to that. Then you say that that you can look at the at the ring structure. And then you can see the growth rates of the fish. Larger indicates that it had fast growth, and smaller indicates that it had a slow growth. Just like a tree, I guess. Yeah. But if you have two different populations, wouldn't there be different growth rates between them? So if yep. you have a mixed population, then would you still be able to distinguish based on this where they are coming from? Yeah, you or could. Or is that but not important? No, I mean you could, you can use these, and uh, this is used a lot in the Faroe Islands. But uh, for some populations, you can't use it because uh, it's because uh, they have a similar uh, environment when growing up, so the rings would be similar. For example, you have the same spawning time, 
yeah. same. So for some populations, you can use it, but not for all. So that's why you need to supplement it with other methods. Okay. And then I saw it's very sad, of course, uh, that uh, at Figure 2, that, um, that um, the, the landing, they, it, it crashed, and, and, or the population crashed, but you had a ban uh, for 30 years, and then the population came back uh, to normal. But I also see that the, the landings of the fish is back at the same level. Do you think that is a problem in terms of that we could have a crash in the population again at some point? Because I see the levels are the same as they, they were before it, it crashed. Yeah. It collapsed, sorry. Yeah, it could, yeah, it could be a problem. Uh, usually we have this figure, uh, we include the, the biomass of the stock or the estimated biomass of the stock. This is, it's not included in this figure, but uh, you can see how these two, there was a high bio, biomass and then there was a high uh, fishing and then, you know, the collapse. Um, so when you look at these landings, you have to also think about the biomass of the stock. So maybe the biomass of the stock, I don't, I don't actually know, but it might be a lot higher now. So that's also important. You also, you have to compare your landings to the estimated bio stock. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you're not monitoring, this could be a bad thing, but if you're actually keeping an eye on how much is there and managing it sustainably, then you might prevent another collapse. And I guess they're more focused on that now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, the more bioinformatics parts, right? So, you, page nine, you talk about tandem repeats. Yes. And you say that they can vary in size from one nucleotide to six, depending on the loci. And you also mentioned a SNP, which is single nucleotide polymorphism. How do you, if it's important at all, how do you actually distinguish whether it's a tandem repeat or it's a, it's a SNP? If, if both can be, uh, if the tandem repeat can be one nucleotide. So, for <laughs> so the tandem repeat is a, it's a repeat. So you would have mm -hmm. the same letter repeated all tandemly. Uh, but if, uh, for the SNP, it's only one variation, so it's just the same letter that changes. So it's well, not repeated. It, does it say? Does it say repeated once? Uh, so in the first uh, second uh, sentence in the second paragraph, the repeat unit in these tandem repeats vary in size from one nucleotide to six. Yeah. So yeah. So the repeat unit is the thing that's repeated. So if you have one nucleotide. It's repeated several times, or you get two new nucleotides. So you have AT, 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 or just have T, 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 T. So for a SNP, you would just have one place. It's not repeated. Yes, yeah, so maybe just uh, yeah. maybe it's not. Um, maybe it's an unfortunate way of writing it. Tracing, doesn't matter. Um, then you talk about genome assembly, and I don't know if we should go into that now or, or wait for the manuscripts. Uh, but um, I guess in the, you have it in the introduction. So you talk about two different types and two different methods of doing genome assembly. And the first that was really int introduced was the overlap layout consensus. So can you quickly explain what, what is the principle behind OLC and what are the pro and cons with it? Yes, so the <coughs> OLC, which stands for overlap layout consensus. Uh, this is a graph-based method. So you start with all your, uh, with, all, with all your reads and then you, uh, you uh, find the overlap between them. So you take all of your reads and you compare them to all of your reads. And then you find the overlap between the reads and then you find which layout is the correct one and then you find the consensus sequence. Now, because you have to compare all reads to all reads. Uh, this is very computationally expen expensive. And uh, as your coverage increases, so does the time uh, to do the assembly. So that's one of the disadvantage. And then I compare this to the De Bruyne graph, which is uh, same principle, but you don't look for the actual overlap. Uh, you take your reads and you split them into k-mirrors, which are 
subunits of k length of your reads, and then you uh, <coughs> then you build up your graph from these k mirrors, and then you only add the unique k mirrors to your graph, so you don't have to compare everything to everything. So it takes less time and uh, uses less memory, if I remember correctly. Yes. Oh well, it's all relative to how much memory you have, or how much you have in your sample, right? Because and mm. especially if you have a lot of um, unique cameras, you will require a lot of memory to assemble it. Yeah. Exactly. But now we talk about cameras. What is a good cameras size, and how do you determine it? It's a good question. Mm. Um, <coughs> it's a good cameras size. Well, it uh, it depends. Is there such a thing? Oh, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> well, so usually most assemblers they uh, they run a uh, they try to find the most appropriate K-mir before they do this process by looking at the different reads. So a good K-mir for one species might not be a good K-mir for another species. It depends on your sequencing data, how much variation you have. So yeah, so it depends on what your data is actually. So it's best to run one of those programs that can actually look for the best, most appropriate k -mir. Do you know how it does that? Uh, it's maybe an evil question, so don't get nervous. <laughs> I, I can't really remember exactly, but basically you um, split up all your sequencing data into reads and it forms this graph. So you uh, make a his uh, frequency plot with all your different k-mirs and then you will see uh, at the lower end of the graph you will find your uh, sequencing error this very on low frequency uh, k-mirs which you can usually say okay these are sequencing errors and then you will get a curve where uh, where you will get yeah it depends on your organism if it's a diploid or a haploid organism you might get one or two peaks uh, which represent the two alleles and then you will uh, fit a model to find the correct k-mir that part i'm a bit unsure about but yeah don't worry Something so uh, so now you mentioned that if you have you will have a, a plot where you will have a, a high peak in the beginning it will go down and then you will have one peak if it's a uh, um, yeah oh i lost the word but it doesn't matter in the beginning yeah. For the ones that you say are sequencing errors, why do you say that? Um, because they are uh, very uh, unfrequent. You don't see them very often. So when you sequence, you usually try to sequence uh, at least 30x coverage, maybe even 100 if you want to do an assembly. So if you only see this specific K-mir once or twice, it's very unlikely that it's actually present in the genome because you have such high coverage, you would have sequenced it more than that. Yes, true. So you can do something called uh, error correction. You mentioned also in your thesis. What is the so what is the principle behind that, and what, what how do you actually do it? I mean, you, yeah. you type a program, but what is the principle yeah, so it's behind it? It's the same principle with with the K-mirrors. So you take your um, reads, you split them up into K-mirrors, and then you find uh, yeah. So you plot them. Maybe I should draw it. I don't know if we should okay. move the camera to the... Okay. Perfect. So you will have a plot with your different K-mirrors. Can you see? Yes. And you will have the frequency. And then you will we plot you. You go through your reads. You will see uh, the frequency is roughly uh, the average frequency that you or the coverage, average coverage that you have over the genome, which we would say 30x. And then suddenly you get the drop, and it goes up again. So you say, okay, this is a sequencing error because the coverage is very low. So what you try to do when you're doing error correction, you try to okay, maybe if we change this base to an A. And then you do it again, and then you see if it just goes on. It doesn't drop, then you say, oh, it's probably the correct one. And then you go through all the different uh, options. And, yeah. Yeah, you can see, but I'm nodding. 
Okay. <laughs> um, yes. So going back to uh, no, I, I want to talk a little bit more about KMS. So KMS is a number, right? But um, let's say that you 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 two, what is what is the range of the KMS usually? Uh, is it like 155? Is it 55? And do you know that? Um, so obviously it has to be smaller than your read length, yes. which is usually 150. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it can be two. Yeah. So usually yeah. they are odd numbers mm -hmm. because uh, if they form even numbers, they could form palindromes. So that is a. What is a palindrome? It's when your sequence uh, matches uh, in both directions. So, yeah, I could draw one on here. If, yeah. Yeah, so they are odd numbers. And then also you can't have them too short because if you have them too short, you will find a lot of matches within your genome. Because, yeah, so basically you want them to be long enough so that they're unique. You don't find them too many times, but also short enough that uh, your uh, assembly graph doesn't get too uh, complicated. Yes, exactly. So when you have a small KMA, you will have a very complex graph. And uh, the larger the KMA you will have, you will have um, less complex and limited overlap in, in the low coverage areas. So now you mentioned that you need um, uneven numbers like 55, 75. Do you, do you actually, and this is nothing that you need to know, but do you actually know the KMA size in all paths that you use? It, it's uh, it's hard coded. And it's, you can't change it. It's hard coded. I sort of think it was ninety one, but I don't know why where I got well, the number. It was ninety six, so it's 96. actually an even number. Yeah, oh, so even I number. always okay. wondered why they use ninety six, but it's okay. it's hard coded. You can't change. Yeah, so you can use even numbers, but uh, it's just more complicated, I think. So. So further on, you you talk about uh, different uh, ways to measure the the quality of your assemblies. Yes. And one of them is N50. Yep. Could you maybe explain uh, what N50 is? So maybe draw something on the, the blackboard yes. if you feel comfortable about that. Yep. So N50 is a uh, weighted mean of your of the size of your scaffold. So the way you calculate it. Oh. <laughs> Just going to remove this. Nice. So, yeah. so you short your scaffolds by size. So we're going to have a very short assembly here. So these are all your scaffolds. And then you take your largest one and then you uh, add it to the next one. And then you do that all the way through until you reach 50% uh, of all of your sequences. So. Uh, when you sum them up, you have included 50% of the total assembly. So the, num the scaffold that you added, the last one that you added when you uh, reached 50%, the size of that scaffold is your N50. Yes. And there's also the NG50, which is mm -hmm. basically the same principle. But so instead of using half of your, uh, your sequences, you uh, want to find half of the actual genome size. So you divide it by the genome size. And very often you see when you read uh, manuscripts, they report the N50. And wow, we had a better N50 than, than other uh, genomes that were published. And you also touch upon that N50 is maybe not always the best measure to use. Yeah. So <clears throat> in principle, N50 is it's a good metric to use. Uh, mm -hmm. However, if you if that's the only thing you look at, you could just defi uh, this, uh, make an uh, assembler that uh, just merges all your scaffolds together, and then you get this massive scaffold, and then you have a very high N50, and that's very good. It doesn't actually look at if these scaffolds that are, um, or contexts that are merged together actually belong together or not. So that's why it could be problematic to look only look at this metric. So you look at, at, at different uh, measures and stuff, or, uh, or, or, or together with, with the N50. 
and um, uh, it, no, maybe you should just wait for that. We will get back to that later. I think this is all I have for the instruction. I know. Should we move on to the next? Should I just continue? Yeah, I, I think uh, as we are in the middle of the. The, the technical stuff. So I think it's uh, it would be good if you moved on to the to the first uh, paper, and then I can maybe supplement. Or even if Tom has a question, he's uh, he's very welcome to to come up with a with an additional question or two. No, I, th I think right now you guys have covered most. I mean, the ones I have relate to the past, so we'll forget about it. So you guys go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so um, you, uh, maybe this is just very like, very details I'm going into. I just want to hear because you say that generally more variation are expected in the non-coding regions than in the coding regions. So assembling the whole genome, um, rather than just the transcriptome, uh, means that you have a more detailed population genetic markers that can be that be developed. Um, not that it's wrong, but but why 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 do you think so? Like, can you elaborate on it? Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> the non-coding parts are there's usually more variation because uh, it's not as conserved because it might not be uh, used as much. So uh, it will it will be conserved through uh, yeah throughout time. So that's why you could find more variation there. So that's what. Uh, we were thinking that you could actually find more. You find more markers there, but how it, it's not. It doesn't actually mean that you will find the ones that uh, differentiate between populations there, is because the ones that differentiate between population would probably be under sel selection, because maybe they have adapted to a uh, environment. So that's uh, so you could suspect that the. Uh, these markers that actually vary between populations would be within or very close to coding regions. But uh, yeah. But can, yeah, can so I, it could go I, either way. Yeah. Can I say something? Because when when you look at the, the, the genome, so so what is the so do you have any idea of what is the sort of the the um, do you see uh, see peaks of or do you, is is the variation? Is it is it only in specific regions, or is it spread throughout the genome? When you look at it, uh, is there any indications of how the how the variation? Because what you're suggesting is that that there is some peaks of divergence within the genes, and then there's no differentiation for the rest of the genome, or or very little. So so have, do you have any idea of of how that is distributed within? Within hearing, yeah, so uh, there seems to be quite. Yeah, we just looked at it roughly. Seems to be quite. The variation seems to be spread all over the genome. It's not just one specific place. But when we looked at the markers that we find for in the population structure, uh, they tend to be in a few a few places, not just one place, but a few different places. And we okay. haven't actually checked if they are within coding regions or not. Mm. So you say that, and this is also true, that <clears throat> that uh, using different assemblers will give different results. Uh, but when you at the same time have different uh, populations of the fish, where well, it might be a variation in the genome because they have adapted to different uh, environments. Like how how do you determine which one is the is the one that it, um, the difference that is caused by the assembler or due to the different um, populations you have? I don't know if it makes sense. But <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So, I mean, if you uh, assemble um, one herring from one, uh, hmm. from one population and another herring from another population, you compare them, you could find variation that's just individual variation. Or, so you don't know if it's actually population related or not. Uh, but if you have one assembly that you use, and then you align all your reads from your resequencing experiments to the same assembly, then you can compare between them. 
because they use the same reference. So what did you do in, 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 in your manuscript here versus the, the draft assembly that you actually, in the end, you take your genome that you improve using long weeds and then you take the final merge, the, the final scaffold the genome and you merge it with the draft genome? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that assembly is a mixture of uh, different variation from both from the both different the assembly approach and, and assembly also from the different fish, yeah. Yeah. So before you, you start uh, assembling your, your genome, um, you do some quality control. Um, but in what order do you actually do it? Because in, in table one, you say that the quality control for pattern we consist of quality trimming and adapter removal. Is that the order you, you did it in? Or is it the order you would do it in? Um. Yeah, so I use the, the program that does both of those things at the same time. I'm not okay. actually sure which one it takes first, but I guess, uh, yeah. So if you, you it yeah, if you remove the, so usually the, in the sequencing read, the end, towards the end, you will get lower quality. Mm -hmm. So you could maybe suspect that the, if the adapters are at this place, and then you remove parts of the adapter that are low quality. And then when you're trying to remove the whole adapter, it doesn't align because only parts of it is there. So you wouldn't actually remove it. So you wouldn't find it because you've already changed the data. So you would remove the adapters first and then you would do the trimming. Yeah. Because you can also imagine that, um, that the adapter has a perfect um, the adapter is an artificial sequence, right? And it could have a perfect uh, thread score. So you might not trim it and you will end up having adapters in your, in your reads that you try to um, use for the assembly. Exactly, yeah. I actually have, uh, usually when I teach uh, introduction to uh, next generation sequencing, I have this example, uh, which is actually a fish also. So okay. um, if you take the standard Illumina uh, data and you just blast it, you get the carb genome. So really? The top heat, That's the, the first top one. Heat is the top is the carb genome. I always use that as a bad example, like remove uh, your adapters first. Um, uh, it, I've, found it interesting to hear that the N50 has been shown to be negatively correlated with the quality of an assembly. Yes, this was one study that concluded Yeah, I didn't that. read it myself, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I guess it depends on how, how, uh, how you design your assembler. I mean, yeah. if you design it not to be too greedy, then it wouldn't be a problem, but if you are, if your only goal is to make the assembler that produces the assemblies with the highest NG50, I think that's when you would find this. So one one question um, uh, in regards to the assembly: Did you check it first? Uh, so you have all your reads from your your kidney. I remember it as kidney, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but did you actually check if you have any contamination in it? Uh, from other uh, other species? Other or species from, from you, from, uh, uh, from the environment? Like, are yeah. you 100% sure that what you have is uh, pure herring or could you have bacteria or other? Mm. Yeah, uh, so one of the reasons why we chose to use the kidney was that it was from inside the herring, so you wouldn't get contamination from other herring. For example, when you catch herring in a troll, they, you know, get all crushed together. So that's why we thought we could use the kidney, so we wouldn't get contaminated from other species. Uh, but all, of course, you have the intestines inside as well, and if those rupture and then you have the bacteria from the intestine all over, that could be a problem. So... Um, <coughs> I actually blasted it uh, against uh, the human. Didn't really find any significant few reads, but uh, nothing significant. But uh, I haven't tested for uh, different uh, other organisms. So it is possible, yes. Um, I, I once had a, 
a sample where we we couldn't assemble to anything meaningful and then we we did a, a mapping against some reference databases and there was a lot of acne um, bacteria in it and then um, we went back to the lab and, and the, the guy that was handling the, the data he had a lot of acne in his oh, face no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so but do you think actually that that, uh, that you already had uh, a genome is that would that actually help you uh, yeah. in relation to contamination because yeah. if, if you started out from scratch so you had a complete the novel assembly. Yeah, that's true. Of course, we had the other one was available, so we could just align our reads to that assembly and then only use the reads that aligned. Or you could at least see how how much of it aligns and how much doesn't align. And what doesn't align, you could probably assume comes from somewhere else. Mm. Yeah. So, but I didn't do that. I didn't only use the reads that align to the other herring genome because uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of gaps in that genome, so I didn't want to remove any sequences that maybe we could get that they weren't able to assemble. So is is there? I was thinking. So now there was an assembly, and now you've made an, another one. So what are the what are the? So would you like to do another one, or do you want somebody else to do another one? Or, <laughs> so how, how good no, how yeah. good do you want it to be? So yeah. So first of all, the reason for actually doing a de novo assembly when there was already one was because we had already generated the data. We had all the data there, spent all the money on generating the data, and then this assembly came out. So that's why we thought, okay, maybe we can do it better. Yeah. We couldn't, so <laughs> we tried to merge it together and get an improved result. Yeah. Mm. So, so, but I so, don't don't think you have to keep doing assemblies. All no, together. no, I'm just saying. So, so what if this should be a sort of a, a significant improvement? So, basically, the the holy grail that you have all all bases on all chromosomes and everything. So, so is there any sort of significant advances that you would go to in order to to uh, in technology that that could help you? generate uh, like the, the, the perfect genome or? Yeah, I think, I, I don't know. I don't think it's possible to create the perfect genome, genome but I think with this uh, long reads, third generation sequencing, where you can get maybe whole molecules, I think that's the technology where in the future we're probably going and get the almost perfect assembly, assemblies. I mean, if you couldn't sequence a whole chromosome in one run, it's really good, but yeah, although it, as of this moment, there are quite a few errors within those technologies, but yeah, if you look at the chromosome level herring assemblies, they use pack bio sequencing and they got a really good assembly. So I think ter third generation sequencing is, is the way forward for, uh, for this kind of assemblies, yeah. You can also do a combination, so you start doing one uh, Illumina-based assembly and then you use your PacBioLate data or your link data to, uh, to, to improve it uh, yeah. or, or the other way around. Hmm. Um, uh, uh, yeah, in the beginning of the third generation sequencing uh, technology, you used a lot of next generation sequencing data to uh, correct the, the reads from the third generation sequencing. Exactly. So I'm interested in the FRC curves that you have. Um, mm -hmm. On page 32, you talk about features, right? The yes. FRC, um, when you look at the different uh, assemblies you have, uh, you look at the total number of features, like the A1 has 464,000 features and the A2 has lower. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by features in this uh, context? Yeah, so this is uh, features from this uh, FRC BAM program, which it uh, calls uh, these, uh, yeah, we call them features because it indicates that there's an error there based on your uh, sequencing results. So uh, <clears throat> in the FRC curve, you get, uh, it's, um, how did they say it? It was a combination of the correctness as well as the fragmentation. So that's why they look at the coverage. So when I mentioned these 
It's just the number of features, total number of features that were in the genome for all the different feature types as well. There were 14 different feature types in total, right? Yeah. But, and then uh, 11 was left out, and oh, sorry, three was left out. So the, the table you see on 32, where you rank them, uh, just according to the, the best uh, feature, it's only based on 11. Yes. Have you looked into what happened if you included the last three ones? Um, does it change because the A3 and the draft are very close in the, in the, yeah. in the ranking? Yes, so uh, yeah, if you included the, the reason for excluding those three uh, features was because uh, some of the assemblies had very few data points for those. So if you want to uh, estimate the curvature or the steepness of the curve, it was, we didn't think it was fair to estimate it from just two points. So that's why we excluded ah, them. Yeah, it was that low, okay. Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> so I tried to look look at what it looked like if we included those three features. And it did actually change the ranking. Uh, so here, uh, A3 is ranked first, and then A2 and the draft are uh, both come in second. So when I included all the features, um, basically A, A2 and the A3 switch place. So A2 becomes the first one. And then the draft is the second one, and then A3 is the third one. So it does change. Mm -hmm. So when you compare the, um, uh, when you merge the uh, next page, when you merge the um, your A2 with the draft genome, so you get A3, then you uh, remove uh, some regions. Um, have you looked into what was actually in those regions? Like you remove, I think, uh, 17 uh, megabytes from the from the sequence. Yeah. Have you tried to, to look into what that was? Maybe it's actually some contamination, something that should not be there or? Mm, uh, yeah, no, I haven't actually yeah. looked more than uh, when when we ran the Busco results and then we found that we were missing some Buscos. I found some of them in these uh, sequences. So, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I think uh, in their assembly, they use the, some transcriptome data within their assembly. And I think a lot of the very short reads that uh, are actually uh, are from the distance transcriptome data. So they are just, just a single gene. So I, I'm not sure why our, our data didn't align to this. So basically when the sequences are removed, these are sequences that don't, there's no alignment with, between the genomes. So the buscos that were removed uh, were in the removed uh, uh, data. Does that happen to be the same buscus that are missing from the chromosome level assembly? I'm not sure. That's very interesting. Oh, I haven't checked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, the chromosome level assembly has a lot fewer, I think it was a hundred fewer buscus. Yeah, something like that. Um, yeah. I remember. Yeah. That's a very interesting point. Mm -hmm. um, you write that A2 has more misassemblies, if I remember right. Then it's page 37. The A2 assembly had the most misassemblies and A1 had the fewest. Yeah. So since you're using A2, you are actually bringing on the misassemblies to your A3 genome. Yeah, but these uh, misassemblies are uh, compared to the chromosome level assembly. Mm -hmm. So they could be misassemblies or they could be genetic variation between the individuals. So, yeah. So, yeah, so that's, <laughs> yeah, it could be misassemblies and it could be just variation. So yeah, that's the reason that we didn't think that A2 was better to use. No. I can just continue, Aina, so <laughs> just, just come in if there's something. I think, if it, well, two points. Like, first first of all, we were told that we have we have only one hour uh, oh. each, <laughs> uh, which we have to think about. And uh, the other thing is that uh, eventually I would like to get to manuscript four. So we may have to uh, to move on to, uh, to 
to the other manuscripts uh, at some stage. I think we we more or less used an hour now, so we are we are we're halfway through our time and and uh, we're not halfway through the manuscript. So maybe we can move a bit bit faster and then no, I would at least like to have a bit of time at the end for you will get don't worry you will get time. Because this was just the, the, the basic, uh, um, more like the mathematics assembly stuff. So I, I don't have a, a lot for the for the rest. So no, no, me, me, I, I don't have too much about the manuscript uh, two and three uh, either. Not, but I, I think we can. I think we should go. Uh, at least, since they're in the thesis, we need to put <laughs> put a bit of emphasis on that. And I, I think, maybe from my perspective, it's more like. Or general questions, and 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 I, I was a, I was a bit curious. How 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 did you end up looking at connections? So so so, how did that, did that come about? Of all the yeah. genes you could have looked at, why those, and why not a lot of other genes? Yeah, it seems a bit random, but uh, this is actually uh, this was uh, my uh, supervisor Sven Olles, uh, idea. And in the past, he has worked a lot with connections, so it's sort of his his baby, the connections. So, and he has a lot of knowledge about the connections. So it's easier to uh, analyze something that you know, and it's easier to spot the mistakes when you know the gene family. Mm. So that's the reason that we chose that one. Yeah. yeah. But do you think that's the, the, if you looked across other other gene families, would, would you have? Would you encounter the same uh, um, problems or challenges or whatever? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Uh, one of the things that connections also have is they have these regions that are quite um, quite conserved, and then also you have quite a lot of these genes, especially within fish. So if these are close together and they have regions that are very similar, there's a higher probability that maybe you could get some assembly error because it sort of looked like repeats. So that's also one of the one of the reasons why they're good to assess the assembly quality. Mm. But, but you, you haven't you haven't done any sort of other uh, other genes or, or whatever where, where you uh, try to look at the, the, the then because I, I would I would imagine that that could be a, like a huge job to to clear up all this uh, nomenclature errors and so on. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so now we haven't looked at other gene families except for just the Buscos and then the, the specific connection family here. Do you have anything else to the connection spent? Yes, so, I, yeah. so it's very clear that this whole naming uh, is a mess in the literature community. Um, also that you showed very nicely in, in the presentation. And you make very good arguments uh, and reasons for clearing it up. Um, but do you think it's 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 even possible to clean it up and, and make the whole community stop saying that this is GP6 like when it's actually a GP4? Do you think it's it's possible or do you think it's a, a lost cause? Uh, I don't know if it's a lost cause, but it's uh, it might be diff difficult for the people who are actually uh, who are look, uh, studying these genes, but I think um, clearing it up would actually make it easier to study these genes because oh. now you try to compare GGB7 from one species when it's actually GJA2 or something just because the naming is not correct. So I think, yeah, maybe a bit of uh, resistance, but I think it's not a lost cause. If you could uh, get it into the annotation processes, where they would, the future genomes would be annotated and then with the correct names, then I think eventually you would sort of get it into the community. So this is the task uh, you're taking on now. Can you hear me, Swanewa? So <laughs> she volunteered. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have more for this. No. Uh, well, I, I think uh, it will be something that will take some time, but uh, we are in fact thinking of it, yes. Good. I think also, um, I can't remember the author, but there was this recent paper by another author that also suggested that the naming of the connexins, he looked at also mammals and different individuals. Uh, no, it was only mammals. And he suggested also that this naming was a bit strange. So. I think 
people are up for it. <laughs> it's like uh, Fages. I started working a lot with Fages recently, and uh, a whole group actually converted into Fages Discovery and developing tools for Fages Biology. Uh, there, you, you, there's no real naming uh, rules for that. So, so they, they are. I saw some Fages. They were called Weirdo. And uh, <laughs> we looked into it, and it was because the kid was um, asked, like, uh, what does this look like? And, oh, it's a weirdo. And then <laughs> the, the person who had it decided to call it weirdo, like something, something. Um, it's fun, but it's not very practical. <laughs> no, it's not. OK, so uh, manuscript five. Uh, uh, no, three, but it was on my page five here. Um, that was the one that uh, you unfortunate mate uh, forgot to to click enter on uh, on the cleaning step, and that's something that everybody can do. So no worries. But and it's good that you actually found out. But I would like to know how does it actually uh, affect the whole uh, results that we have seen in the manuscript? Because we have only been able to to look at what you wrote in the manuscript and not the final one. So I know that you have reduced um, regions of sex determination from, from 6 to 2 or 6 to 4. Uh, but what, can, can you maybe talk a little bit about how it changed and if it changed the conclusions you have in your manuscript uh, and, and what actually happened after you reduced the noise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so OK. Yeah. Um, so when we ran it again. We ran it again using the chromosome level assembly. So uh, <clears throat> so when we ran this with the chromosome level assembly, we actually got only two peaks, as I mentioned, on chromosome 8 and 21. Um, that's what I mentioned about reducing the noise. So we had fewer regions that showed up. Yeah. Um, so we didn't try it on the same reference assembly. So I don't think comparison is a bit it's not, uh, I don't know, it's not correct because this is a different reference assembly as well. So some of the, the mm. noise that were, was removed was due to using the higher quality assembly while the other was due to removing uh, low quality sequences as well as more stringent SNPs. So yeah. I have actually prepared a, uh, <laughs> a slide with, uh, with the figures from the yeah. new manuscript. I don't know if you want to see them. Sure. They're not that many. OK, let me just see if I can share this. Because I, I was wondering, because um, you go to 90, page 96 and 97, you exactly say that the results are uh, from figure three, that they are a little bit different from expected. So. I was looking forward to hear if it's more like expected now um, than it was in the first version. Yeah, so uh, I think what I mentioned it. So this is the Manhattan plot from this uh, from the second analysis. You can see there's still some noise there, but uh, only these two peaks were actually uh, uh, above the threshold. Mm. So we want there to be at least three SNPs above the threshold before we counted it as a peak. And uh, what I mentioned about the unexpected results was probably that they were on different scaffolds. So we were expecting, we were, what I said in the thesis was that uh, we would expect them to be on the same chromosome, that it was just the assembly that wasn't good enough to show this. But actually with this chromosome level assembly, we can see it's still on two different chromosomes, which is quite unusual. I mean, it could be explained that maybe it's uh, two different genes or it's a polygenic sex determination system. But actually, it's, uh, uh, we don't think that's the case uh, because when we look, polygenic uh, systems usually have uh, a skewed sex ratio, but for herring, it's uh, it's one-to-one -one ratio. And also, when we look at this second plot here, uh, what you can see that uh, even for the two different chromosomes, there, oops, there's always, uh, both regions are always either homozygous or heterozygous. You never get a mixture of those two. So when you have a Mendelian segregation, you would by chance expect some individuals to have a heterozygous chromosome 21 
and the homozygous chromosome eight, but uh, that's not the case. We can't find any individuals. Oops, let me just swap these. Here, yeah. So you never see that green here and blue here. There's a bit of noise, but some SNPs can vary, but there's never the whole region that's blue here and green up there. So that's why it was very strange. So it could either suggest that these two chromosomes uh, don't segregate individually, that they actually form. There are some studies where sex chromosomes actually form this, uh, this complex where they merge together during segregation so that there's always, they always end up in the cell, same cell. Um, <clears throat> but more likely, I think that there's actually something on uh, chromosome 21 that could be supposed to be on chromosome 8. But uh, <clears throat> if you have these whole genome duplications, you could, for example, have these two chromosomes that have been duplicated. So they are, even though they are degraded now, they don't, they're not that similar, but they could be. One of them is a homologous uh, chromosome of the other one, which would explain why some of the reads are aligning to this, this region. <clears throat> but actually, we have uh, had some personal communication with uh, Life Andersson's group in Sweden, and they have actually also studied herring sex determination. And they gave us very little information, but they basically said that they have identified the gene. What we wanted to find out was if this uh, reference assembly, the chromosome level assembly, was from a, a female or a male individual. And they said that it was from a male individual but they had removed the part. So it was basically a female. So to me, that sounds like it's a sex specific sequence that they have removed. And I would assume that maybe the, this gene on this sex specific sequence that they have removed probably has an analogous gene on chromosome 21. I didn't like the, the, the sentence you said with that it was a male and then they removed the part and it turned into a female. <laughs> it didn't turn into a female, but yeah. Uh, they said they removed that part, so it, it was yeah. essentially a female genome, a female assembly. Yeah. Aina, do you have any? Oh, I mean, I'm, ju I'm, just, uh, I'm just curious. So, so, so if you wanted to get closer, so I know I also, like talking to daughter, I've heard that Life Anderson's group are working very hard on this uh, sex determination system. But how, how how would you come about if you wanted to get if you wanted to get closer to to understanding this uh, system? Is there an experiment you could set up, or uh, uh, do you want to have a knock knockout herring or whatever? Uh, I think, yeah, I think basically now we know it's somewhere around here. We could do more targeted sequencing. Yeah. So uh, a more targeted specific higher coverage and uh, maybe just one higher coverage male or a few and then uh, higher coverage females and then you can try to assemble them and then see if you actually get a sequence that's not present in females but only in the males. Hmm. But I, I still find it a little bit difficult to understand how, how, how this uh, system, how this system works. Uh, so, so if if it's on, so can it be on two chromosomes or? <clears throat> it can. I think it can, but uh, I think we would see some other evidence of this. I mean, but, but you trust your assembly, so it's not like the the two yeah. chromosomes merge into one. I don't think so. I try to align uh, the these two regions. They don't actually align. Okay. So there's no uh, there's no yeah they're not similar, which is very strange. So that's why there must be something that's removed. I'm assuming it's removed from chromosome eight. Mm -hmm. But then there's this onolox gene on chromosome twenty one, which where so the so our uh, when we sequence this and we try to align our reads, there's nothing on chromosome 8 that it can align to because it's not in the reference genome. So the most closely uh, species, or the species that 
not species, sorry, the sequence that's most similar is on chromosome 21. So I think that's why we get chromosome 21 up is because the SNPs from chromosome 21 are reads that are aligned to this region, but they actually should be aligned to this missing region from chromosome 8. Mm. Don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Mm. I also think this yellow line here, it's very funny because so basically the, the light blue ones are <coughs> homozygous reference and the yellow ones are homozygous alternative. And we know that this genome was uh, assembled using um, long reads. So it sort of looked like this part has been uh, assembled from, uh, from one of the alleles the <clears throat> the reference allele and then this part is from the other allele so because it's a male it has a it's a heterochromatic so this orange here i believe i don't know i just imagine that it's from this part that was removed is somewhere within this orange place here because this is the homozygous alternative allele so when they assembled it they used molecules from the yeah, I will call it the female allele, the blue part, and the male allele, the orange part. But then they only remove the, the sex-specific sequence. But then this orange is SNPs that are very close to the sequence, so they are in, in uh, linkage to equilibrium. So that's why uh, it's, it's orange, yeah. I don't know if that makes sense, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, do you have, Bente, do you have more questions on manuscript three? No. Okay. So maybe we should go to to manuscript four. Um, uh, maybe I just have yeah. a comment. Yeah. Um, it's, it's maybe a stupid one, but just as uh, if you take the, uh, I mean, you have a chromosome level assembly that you are looking to, but you are a bit unsure whether it's actually correct. I think you also say that in manuscript one, that you find some differences and you are not sure that the CLA is actually uh, correct. You could try to just check for whether they did the, 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 their bioinformatics properly and if there are any adapters in that like there's in the CARP reference genome because that might have regions where you will not be able to map it properly. It's just mm. a comment. Yeah. Just so because I, it's, a, it's a newer published um, perfect reference genome doesn't mean that they, they did the bioinformatics mm. properly. Yeah, that's a good point. I haven't... I haven't checked it that, uh, I haven't no, no. scrutinized their <laughs> approach, no, no. but yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, so in, in manuscript four, uh, could you elaborate a little bit about how you actually did, uh, so how, how did you start out with the with sort of the, the baseline sampling and also the, the sample designation, because obviously you used uh, sort of traditional stock ID methods for calling your, your, your baselines uh, mm -hmm. in the first place. Yes. So our uh, baseline samples are, uh, <coughs> which we collected in collaboration with uh, the Ferro Marine Institute. And uh, so basically, they use their current methods where they look at the ortholith nucleus and uh, the maturity stage of the gonads and then assign it to one of the <coughs> putative stocks. So that's actually how the reference samples were got the, their stock label. Yeah. So those are traditional used methods. So they might not be, per be perfect. I mean, no. that's, yeah. So, so, but yeah, your your own your your results showed that these methods are not perfect. Although that they actually there was a really good correspondence between the results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very very good correspondence. But of course, you were not looking at a completely mixed situation or or, or anything. You were you were looking at something which was almost pure, but there was a few 
mistaken uh, individuals. Mm -hmm. But 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 one thing that that sort of uh, uh, interests me, or, or I find a little bit curious, is so so what what you did is that you uh, even though that sort of you 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 found that that when you clustered the individuals, then you could clearly identify the different groups. So when you used all your SNPs uh, and clustered the individuals, then you had like three distinct clusters. And uh, but still you used your you still you used your samples as baselines. So you mean that we didn't change the label after the clustering analysis? So what you're thinking yeah, about? That, that, yeah, that's why I did, that's why I'm a bit curious because you basically what you did is you trusted the, the non-genetic methods more than the genetic methods more mm, for yeah. designating populations, which sort of what what's what you were looking for was yeah. the genetics. So so, yeah. so so yeah, that's a very good point. I uh, haven't thought about that, but yeah, I mean we could just uh, just not look at the labels at all and just do cluster analysis and then uh, define our baseline based on those. Yeah, I think that 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 at least it's a very good uh, training exercise. I think that it was a good way of doing it to, to go out sampling and get a good idea of which population you actually, they had a little bit of a handle on it. But after you did the sort of, I can't remember, what is 4.6 million SNPs mm -hmm. for clustering the individuals, then I would, I would trust those. Uh, I would trust those clusters, and yeah. then maybe. So, so then, then again, then, then you had your, uh, then you had your FST table. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was just thinking, could you, if you then used your clusters, could you then recalculate those FST? Wouldn't that be a more uh, more genetic way of doing it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it would. Yeah. I haven't thought about that, but yeah, could go back and do the FSD with these new labels. I don't. I think it will only be a few individuals who are changed, but I think yeah. Yeah, but but imagine imagine you have a population sample where you have you have like huge FSTs between populations. And then you have uh, two samples from the same population, one sample where you mixed in a few individuals from a very divergent population, and the other half of your sample, you haven't mixed in individuals from another population. So you, mm -hmm. you so the so you're basically inflating your, your FST or what? Yeah. Um, do you mean uh, just just the fairy samples and Icelandic samples. I, I'm, to, I'm to re -label looking, them as one? looking at that because you, if if you can put up the 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 figure, the the cluster the clustering thing. Yeah, just one second. The PCA. Uh, your screen. Can you see it? No, sure. It's coming now. Oops, that's the wrong one. Yeah. Sorry. No There we go. Yeah. Oh, no, it's in, yeah. This one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Let me just switch this. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. So if, if if you look at your figure, then you have what is it, five blue individuals. So five 
Ferries, Fjord, Herring, mm -hmm. who are misidentified that were actually, as you said, North Sea Herring. Yes. But for the uh, Icelandic uh, summer spawners, you didn't misidentify any individuals. So you have, if, if, if we just for a second pretend that this is one population, the, the Faroese and the Icelandic, then just by mixing in these five North Sea herring, do you think you, that this actually could explain the high, that, that, because I was surprised uh, that you have an F FST of 13% between mm. the Faroese and the Icelandic. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a very good point. So uh, for the assignment, we actually removed these five herring. Yeah. But for the FST values, I will have to check. I can't remember if I, I don't think I have removed them. But uh, yeah, that's a good point. It would inflate the FST because that's those five are from a different population. So yeah. Yeah. So it's like, because I've just, uh, the last days I've worked on, on populations of uh, tiger sharks. So I'm looking at tiger sharks between the Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific. And the FST you get between Faroese and Icelandic herring is as big as the difference you find between uh, tiger sharks in the two basins, which are looked upon as, as subspecies. So I'm, mm -hmm. I was a little bit curious to see that, that you're actually getting so high FSTs uh, between, between your groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. But but then on the other hand, you you get very high FSTs compared to what people normally find from marine fish. So, mm -hmm. so do you have an explanation for that? Uh, so yeah, basically these are based on just uh, a few, just these 154 SNPs. Yeah. So when I did it on the 344 from the genotyping experiments, yeah, it, it was actually it was lower, even though it was still significant for most of them, but it was a lot lower. So. I think that could be one of the reasons. Yeah. Uh, and 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 then then also, you, but of course, you also said yourself that that the ones that you have the snips that you have you've taken they may be they maybe represent like adaptive variation. Do you have any idea of 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 why they may or may not do that? <clears throat> Yeah, so basically the, these stocks have different uh, spawning time. Yeah. And you could expect that this was, uh, to, this was something that was uh, evolved. So you could see it in the genetics. And uh, yeah, that's one of the major differences is the spawning time, but also the environment that the fish live in. I think the environment between Faroes and Icelandic might not vary that much. But yeah, so that's why I think the variation could be due to selection. Mm. because that's the difference between the herring. You would expect them, they live in this area, so they have evolved some adaption. Not necessarily, but yeah. So like, like you were mapping the, 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 the sex, could you, could you then map perhaps... Uh, so if you, if you have 4.6 million SNPs, could you map those back to the, to the genome and then maybe look... What what is causing the differences? Mm -hmm. the yeah, differences. yeah. You could use you could use the same principle as uh, in the with the paper three. Uh, I think Barrio et al. They actually looked at some of the variations that they could find, and uh, in relation to different spawning time, and they found a few genes that could explain. Uh, I think they looked at spawning time, and I think it was salinity, if I remember correctly. So they mm. could find a few genes that could uh, explain. Uh, yeah, they found SNPs that were close to genes that could explain difference in the spawning time and mm. the habitat. So, so in 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 your manuscript, you 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 do a lot of uh, you do a lot of work with the, where you use uh, where you use uh, structure analysis and. Uh, and then you have uh, sort of the, the the PCA analysis here, which to some extent is 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 more or less uh, you're looking for the same thing basically. 
Yeah. So, so, so which method do you think was the most successful in delineating the different uh, populations? <clears throat> um, I think, well, I like this uh, with the uh, NGS admix software yeah. Yeah. because uh, with the structure analysis is I used you used very specific SNPs. The structure can't handle too many, too much data, too many SNPs, and it can't be in uh, in LD. So that's why we chose it only. We only used 154. So with this analysis, we used 4.6, and in the <clears throat> we so we also did this cluster analysis, which I didn't show in the presentation. But uh, when we used structure for k equals two, the Norwegian spring spawners was were the ones that, that stood out. But when we actually used uh, this uh, NGS admix software, it was actually the North Sea sample that stood out in k equals two. And yeah. I think when we look at this PCA um, <clears throat> plot, that actually there's a lot of genetic variation within the North Sea sample that we didn't really capture in this uh, in the structure analysis. So I mm. think. I think that's a better one. It shows a more complete picture. But, but I, from experience also that when you do structure analysis based on sort of uh, outlier SNPs that may be under selection due to environmental selection, the experience is that you can get quite spurious results. And I think it's because uh, the, some lows I don't sort of affect or don't follow the, the general trend of the whole genome. So they, you can have like, if you have three populations, one population could be fixed for one allele, the other for another, and the third with intermediate, and then they immediately look like they are heterozygotes, or they look like they're they're hybrids between the two populations, simply because that locus is driving so much of the differentiation between them. So, so it's, a, it's a bit... You have to be a bit cautious of using structure when you have uh, high graded your loci to, hmm. to to this extent. Yeah, I think also the authors of the uh, of the software actually mentioned that using it to find the most likely number of K is well, they recommend using some caution when doing that. So yeah, yeah. Um, the population assignment. So 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 when when you did that, I'm not a hundred percent sure. So. So did so here here you have did you use uh, uh, for for your baselines baseline samples did you only use you removed all the ones that were not assigning to your uh, so all the misassigned ones so the ones that were clustering with other populations have you removed those for this yes. Yes. Um, do you have any idea why your test samples were so it you did so? It almost gives you. I, I would actually what I would expect with with the level of differentiation you have. I would expect your assignment to population should be a hundred percent. Since you like you you have FSTs of like forty percent between some of your populations. Mm -hmm. It's like I would expect like three SNPs, the three top three SNPs would be able to define which population an individual comes from. Okay. So I, I think, I, I don't know why that this doesn't give you 100% uh, correct assignment. Yeah, I think maybe also the, the test samples used for assignment. Yeah. Uh, so basically when we say they are assigned correct, we have assigned them before so we've actually took, okay, these are the Norwegian samples. Let's see how many of them assigned to the Norwegian stock. But there yeah. could actually be some mistake within that first assignment. Yeah. So they are actually not Norwegian samples when we thought they were Norwegian samples. But yeah. then because we have labeled them as Norwegian samples, they come out, out as being assigned wrongly. Yeah. So I think that could be one of the reasons. But also the, the, uh, the genotyping experiment uh, we got quite poor results because the DNA was quite degraded. So I think maybe some of them could be missing too many SNPs to get a good assignment. Because it, it, it almost looks like it's uh, completely uninformative with the Faroese and the Icelandic. Yeah. So, 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 
so have, do you have any idea of, of the level of, of missing data? But you could imagine, because it may be a very few SNPs that are actually defining the difference between Icelandic and Faris uh, uh, samples. Mm -hmm. So there may be very few SNPs. So if those SNPs would fall out uh, during the genotyping. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I haven't actually checked which one are missing which SNPs, but yeah, that could be one of the reasons that the specific SNPs for the Faroese or the Icelandic are actually missing. Yeah. But when I tried to do this Monte Carlo cross-validation, I tried it on the these samples uh, from the genotyping experiment as well. And in those results, the the assignment for the Icelandic are in the 80%, but it's the Faroese ones that are only 21%. It's yeah. the ones that are causing the trouble. So I think yeah. that's quite interesting that, yeah, that the Icelandic ones are so, they seem to be easier to assign than the Faroese samples. And I think yeah, 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 yeah. I can find a reason why. <laughs> no, but, but, but one thing is, is uh, what, what about the sample sizes? Yeah, for for these uh, for the test individuals, we had 60, 60 individuals from each stock. I think yeah. we excluded two individuals after quality control. I can't. For, the, for your for your baseline, how, how many how many did you? Uh... Yeah, so for the baseline, it's roughly. I think I included here somewhere. Yeah, twenty seven for the Faroese and thirty for the Icelandic. Only yeah, and 17. then you had to remove some of the Faroese ones. Yeah, exactly. So, 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 do you think because the, 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 this Monte Carlo thing is is where you are you are having a, a a baseline and a holdout sample, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and 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 if, and and if you have few base, relatively few baseline samples, and you have low levels of genetic differentiation, so what happens if if you sort of more or less you're, you're coming, I, I think you're coming to a critical level with respect to yeah. what is actually a baseline and what is a holdout sample. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we definitely need more samples. Yeah. yeah. Um, then, then, then the last thing, I think it's, it's uh, in a management context, you maybe talked about that the ferries Fjord population uh, maybe not that important, uh, but I think in a, in a, yeah. I, I think it's it's yeah. always dangerous <laughs> that all yeah. these populations are always called something like the Faroese herring, the Icelandic, the the Greenlandic, the Norwegian. So it's it's like a, it has some kind of belonging. So of course yeah. you are very interested in the Faroese uh, yeah. fish, although that there may be something that is found in de in different places in 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 the in mm -hmm. the North uh, East Atlantic. So, yeah. so, is there any way that you could come about sort of finding out whether this population is actually a separate population? <clears throat> yeah. So I think uh, I think we should do more studies to find out if it is actually a population. Yeah. Um, one of the <clears throat> So here we used sequencing data. I think we could always use more sequencing data or genotyping data, mm. but uh, we could also use different uh, phenotypic methods. So yeah. uh, when we received these samples from Iceland, the, the people at the Marine Institute, their, their job is to look at the authors, and they said that the authors of the Icelandic samples looked strange. Okay. So I think if we could maybe this assign pop uh, package for R actually allows different types of data. So you could use phenotypic data as well. And there's this um, shape R package that looks at the outline of the otoliths that has been used, for example, for herring populations. So I could I think if you could try to combine these two different data sets and then you could see maybe not with the Genetics, you couldn't get the whole picture, but when you look, combine it with the Oslet data, you would actually see that, or the mm -hmm. Oslet data would indicate that these uh, fish are actually grown up in a different environment than the other ones. Mm. So, which could indicate that it's actually a population. But do you know, 
Do you know which environment is, is the environment, as you were saying earlier, the environments are maybe not exclusive to Iceland and the Faroe Islands. Yeah. And, and, and also like spawning time has been shown to be a relatively label trait in, mm-hmm. in, in hearing. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know how big the variation is between the Iceland and the Faroe Islands, but uh, I think, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, we've, we've, we've been <laughs> we've been uh, hitting you hard for a long time. I've, I've just one one thing more. I've, I've just because I think that if you do the if you do the the cleaning of the data for the FST analysis and maybe also do a, a Manhattan plot of the the differentiation between the Faroese and the Icelandic uh, samples then you will be able to see how the FST is distributed across the, the, the genome for those two. And then, of course, you would be able to see whether that's, uh, there's a signal of adaptive divergence or it's a signal of genetic drift. So you would get some kind of handle on the age. If, is it just a few, few herring from the same population coming to, and to spawn in fairies waters once in a while? Did they come like 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 10,000 years ago? So, so, so by doing this comparative analysis on those two populations only and with clean, the clean data, I think you get much closer to what is actually the, the explanation and also to design a panel that would actually allow you to distinguish between the two with a very high uh, power. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome to contact me, and we can. Uh, I will be happy. To, and daughter, I'm also sure will be happy to to help you uh, uh, get it done. That sounds very good. You're going to regret that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Ben. I've been going on for a long time. So. Uh, no, I. It's it's uh, it's okay. I I think we should. I I don't have. I can find small things, but I, I don't think we should uh, uh, continue forever. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I have just one question. One question for my next group. Um, uh, what was it? Uh, one, two, let me just find it. Uh, it's just going back. It's just like I'm just curious. Ah, yeah, on page 29. I'm just curious because you, we have been talking about that N50 is not, uh, not necessarily the best uh, measure when you um, look at the sample quality because it can be negatively correlated. And you talk about Busco and you talk about uh, many other things that you can uh, assess the quality on. But on the third line, you say that uh, you take the assembly with the best summary statistic, <laughs> i.e. number of contexts, number of scaffolds, and then 50. So here you yeah. kind of find out that you are only using the measures that you say you could not do alone. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I am doing that. <laughs> okay, you did. Okay, good. Yeah. But I, I don't yeah. think I have more item. No. I think also Maybe. we have uh, tormented you for for, for long enough. <laughs> what a, what about the chairman? Does he have any? Uh, does he have a final uh, final question? The big yeah, all encompassing big one. Um, well, uh, first of all, I, w- I will say I have yet to receive any questions from the audience, but perhaps they will start flooding me and. Uh, for the audience, if they are online and want to do it, I think if you click on my little uh, box where it's talking, there's a button in the top right which says like chat, and you can send it through that. Um, but no, I mean, I mean, the others have, have obviously grilled you very, very well. And uh, you know, your thesis topic is quite a difficult one because in this era of genomics, as you encountered, a lot of people are uh, sort of doing similar-ish things, and then you end up with different things, and you have to compare them. But I'm kind of curious, like what, what for you really? is the the future both for the purpose of the management of the fish but you know does a uh, do you think you more work on more individual fish needs to be done to resolve this or have you got enough information now how do you see the forward of this for the benefit of Faroese salmon 
herring, you mean? I think these results are uh, just the first step. I think it would be very interesting to uh, keep going a little bit, at least just to analyze it more, if we could get a cleaner results. Uh, but I hope that this will be used in management. I think uh, the Faroe Islands is I mean, the fishing industry is our main industry. Of course, we should invest a lot of money and try to make it as sustainable as possible. So I definitely think that this is the way forward, not only for herring, but also for other fish species. Can I ask, when you say we should invest, who is the we who should invest in that? <laughs> uh, We, the nation of the Faroe Islands, I think. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. So in Norway, for example, they actually have a levy on the salmon industry. That's why I said the wrong word. So they have a thing called the uh, FHF, which is money where they take 1% of the sales of the salmon and they invest it in the research. Does a fairies have that or is it essentially is it uh, relying on the government to fund the management or uh, i think the government is funding the management okay. uh, uh, this uh, specific project has actually been funded by the industry as well as uh, the the national uh, research uh, institute Yeah, so uh, the uh, industry could invest a lot more money in this. And I think the Norwegian way of actually saying that we need this much percentage of the sales to be used for research is a very good approach. And I think we should do it as well for the fisheries. And so have you actually shown the results to the, I don't know who's relevant, the fisheries or whoever actually is in charge of managing? I mean, what is their input uh, take home on it? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I think... Uh, yeah, the management is a bit complicated. I mean, you have a house law on which uh, give advice to the politicians. And of course, then they have to decide if they follow this advice or not. So uh, the house law on which is a part of this project, they have seen the results and they're very excited about it. And I think they would like to use it in the future if they had money to do it. But I don't know if the industry or yeah, the politicians, I don't know if they're interested. I've, um, so the, uh, yeah, what you call it, the pelagic, uh, the ones that have funded the project. I've presented the results to them and they also find it very interesting. And I think they are interested in actually making it as sustainable as possible. So I think there could be a future there. So it's actually funny you say money. Uh, obviously price has changed. Do you have, uh, and, but now essentially, Thanks to all the work, there's a really good reference genome of the herring now, right? And uh, do you have any idea what it would cost maybe today to, for example, use a resequencing based approach per fish to generate enough data to basically continually monitor? No. <laughs> I know yeah, what. maybe I don't know. Let <laughs> <laughs> me hear Ina's offer, then I'll give you an offer to find out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I think, well, this is... Uh, We've done everything in the Faroe Islands. We sequenced everything yeah. here. As, and yeah, so basically did everything except for the genotyping experiment. So that does make it a little bit more expensive. I mean, if you would go to the cheapest way possible and send it somewhere to get sequenced as cheaply as possible, you would obviously get the price down. And also with the genotyping panel, if you <coughs> sequence, uh, if you... So basically, we have a setup cost because we only did it once. Yeah. So more samples you have, and the uh, next time you do it, you don't have the same cost. Cost go down. So yeah, I don't. Know. I think it's hard. I don't really have a number. No, but but I think you know the interesting thing is you've actually invested all the hard work now, and basically re reaching a kind of screening level where it gets cheaper and cheaper. And uh, with the way the technologies are dropping, I mean, I, my assumption is that sequencing providers, resequencing is probably going to plateau at about $5 a gigabase within the next year or so. And uh, you've got an 800k uh, uh, megabase genome, right? So even if you are resequencing at like, uh, and for population level stuff, you need very low coverage, right? If you've got enough individuals. So if you are resequencing 3, 4, 5x coverage, you're looking at uh, $25 a sample for resequencing. So actually it's not unfeasible to be resequencing a large number of individuals, right, for continual monitoring. And uh, so I think what you've basically generated is a really great baseline, actually, for all sorts of future stuff. Um, 
I know what I was going to say. Yeah, but that, there's also like if you use uh, reduced representation, other types like GTSEC and so on, you can actually just sequence the the hundred most informative markers in a thousand individuals in a single run because then you can split your samples. The problem is if you have to run all the samples in in a few runs, and then the fishermen are sitting there waiting for yeah. the, for the whole year to get all the samples run in in one go, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It, it doesn't all, only have to be cheap. It also has to be practical. Yeah, it, so that I is the challenge. And yeah. I was actually curious about that. I mean, it, like I've never been to the Faroe Islands. I was very excited about going there until COVID uh, screwed that up. But uh, <laughs> like I, purely logistically, I mean, uh, how easy is it for you to get the stuff you needed to do the work? Like, was it, you know, is it easy to get the reagents? Is it easy to get the sequencing stuff? Or is it actually quite challenging? I mean, um it's it's possible it's not i don't know it's we have some challenges that other others don't like for example the extra cost of just transporting it here yeah. usually because it usually comes by plane especially if it's like frozen or yeah. cool stuff so that can be very expensive but uh, we have like uh, we have this um, research uh, park where we have these shared labs and where we actually have sequencing machines mm. So that's really good. Yeah. So it's. And yeah. you have the necessary local computation as well, I guess, power, or you. Now we do. <laughs> if no. not, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, Ola. Yeah. But, uh, but no, anyway, I mean, I, I, I have uh, still not got any questions for the audience. So I'm going to assume nobody in the audience wants to ask any, but they're welcome to speak up now. Uh, I see Gunnar's taking his uh, microphone off, so maybe he disagrees. Does anybody want to ask any questions? No? All right, so uh, I'm not sure he's meant to close this, but essentially what I understand happens now is actually I know Bent and I have to leave, go to another Zoom Bent started, then I've got to find the link to get back in here afterwards, but I guess uh, at this point, uh, we should say thank you for your great talk and doing the nice questions. We will hang up and then try and come back in a while, and I guess we will see you in uh, not too long. Does okay. that sound correct, uh, people running the defense? Uh, so, yeah, I, I would like to thank the committee uh, for the examination, and I'm turning everything it's a little bit upside down, so I'm ending, but i with what I was supposed to start with, and uh, that's to introduce the committee. That's Tom Gilbert, professor from the University of Copenhagen, uh, Dirk Peters, uh, associate professor from the University of Copenhagen, and uh, Aina A. Wilson, professor from ETU. So, so now, if there are no questions uh, at the auditorium. Uh, uh, we will take our pause and then we will meet again when the committee is ready. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> All right, well, uh, Sunva, thank you uh, for, again, for the very nice uh, defense today. Um, you know, we briefly chatted. We uh, we're all pretty much in union, in our opinion, before the exam and it hasn't changed now. We would be delighted to recommend to the authorities that you be awarded the uh, degree of PhD. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Again, we'll clap you from here. <laughs> uh, as we mentioned, it was a, it was a, a great um, pleasure to, uh, to, uh, to examine the thesis. Um, and I say you put up with a great lot of challenges in the post-submission process, which is unusual. Normally it's the pre-submission that goes wrong. And uh, we all agreed you did very, very well today. Uh, you uh, clearly show your expertise across a, a range of areas. So, uh, yes, congratulations. Thank you very much. And uh, to Gunnar, who's texting me, yes, I just sent the email. So, uh, <laughs> so where's, where's the virtual champagne? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, we don't have the champagne here. <laughs> no.
heb ik gevonden. Ik kan een one voor jou hier. Zo, hier go. Pop. Nice. Okay. Dag voor de. Dag voor de. Dag. Zit er bij aan de. I think. Well, let's don't say something. So you don't hear me? No, I did. Okay. So con congratulations with your PhD. And uh, I'd like to thank the committee and the uh, advisors as well. So I know Lenny Carlson from the University of the Faroe Islands and Hans Hatzedown uh, from our tech Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> do we hang up now or <laughs> what do we do now? <laughs> you go celebrate and sleep yeah. all tonight. Go celebrate. Yeah. I will. We'll be happy to help with the uh, if you need some info on on manuscript.